Hi. The last session we talked about price patterns, and in particular, patterns across time where you know, we looked at the relationship between what happened in the last period and this one. We noted how much, the, how much variation there was in the results, depending on whether the last period was a minute, a day, a week, a year, or five years, because the correlations varied, obviously. In this session, I want to take a detour and talk about something strange, which is if you look at price patterns across calendar time, there seem to be some patterns that emerge consistently. So I'm going to call these temporal patterns, and in particular, I'm going to focus on a couple of very, very strange calendar, year, calendar effects that you see in prices. The first is what's called the January effect, which is if you look at returns by month across the years, Across the years, January has been the worst month of the year to invest in stocks. Now, you might already have a story in your mind about why this might be true, but, but, but we'll look at it. But uh, the evidence is strong, not just across the U.S., but across the globe, that January returns are much worse than returns in other months of the year. The second is what's called the weekend effect, which, uh, which also shows that there are differences in returns across the weekdays. In particular, Monday returns historically have been much worse than returns on any other day of the week. There's in fact even evidence of intraday timing patterns where there's evidence that prices seem to swoon in the middle of the day and then recover towards the end of the day. Well, I also have to tell you that I would never invest on the basis of at least the midday swoon and the weekday effect. I might bring the January effect into my investment decisions, but let's take a look at the evidence before we decide whether it makes sense for us as investors to even focus on these patterns. Let's start with the January effect. This is a graph that lists out returns by month of the year from 1927 through 2011 for U.S. stocks. Notice the standout month? By far, January is the best month of the year to invest in. There is some evidence of a drop-off in the middle of the year during, but actually the Th though there's always talk of a summer swoon in stocks, the, the two worst months for investing in stocks, at least over this very long time period, have been September and October. Maybe because you've had the crashes in those months, especially October. But basically, January by far is the best month of the year to invest in stocks. Now let's take a little deeper. If you look at the types of stocks that have these super normal January returns, Remember the small, um, that, that small companies historically have been shown to earn much higher returns than the rest of the market? It turns out that the bulk of those excess returns, the premium that you earn on small cap stocks, almost all of it, is generated in January. That should provide some evidence to us as to what's causing the January effect. Whatever it is that's causing the small cap effect is also causing the January effect because it's really that month of the year that you see the small cap effect kick in. You take January out of the year, the small cap effect might very well disappear. So whatever it is that's happening in January has something to do with market cap. And if you look across markets, you notice the same phenomenon. Every market that you look at, returns in January are much higher than returns in any other month of the year. So this is truly a universal phenomenon. It's cut across time, cut across markets. What might be causing these January effects? Let's hypothesize. One story that's often been told is, it's a, is a tax story, which is towards the end of every year, you get tax selling. Tax selling in the sense you get people selling money losing stocks because they want to claim the capital losses against capital gains with this. So they oversell stocks that have gone down the most in the previous year in December to claim the taxes. And then after the year turns, they buy these stocks back. But you're saying, but the tax laws don't allow you to buy the same stock back? You don't have to buy the same stock back. You could buy one loser and you know, sell one loser, buy back another loser. So one story is a tax story. But if that's the reason, we should be able to make money off it, right? Just wait till the end of each year and buy the biggest losers of the year because if the tax story is right, those losers will get pushed down too far and then they're going to bounce back up in January. The reason the story is a little fuzzy and it doesn't quite fit is if you look at the January returns, it's not just restricted to money losing stocks. Money making stocks also seem to make it. The second story is an institutional story, which is that institutions like to clean up their books towards the end of e each year, do some window dressing, and in the process they get rid of those stocks that look bad and add those stocks that look good, and then once the turn of the year happens, they come back to markets with a vengeance with a lot of cash. 
and cause the stocks to go up. Again, that might or might not be true, but if that's the case again, we should be, as the rest of the investors, able to take advantage of it. But I think the, the reasons have to be a mix. I, I don't think it can be any, it, it, I think the tax story has sense. I think the institutional trading story has sense. I also think there's something about markets, and this may be behavioral finance, where investors feel happy with, when they start with a clean slate, when they feel happy, they push up stock prices, sounds completely irrational. But again, that's behavioral finance. Investors often do things that make no sense. But whatever the reason, by far the best month of the year to invest in is in January. How would I incorporate this into my investment process? If I'm planning to buy a stock anyway, and if I've lined up these 10 stocks I'm going to buy, I would much rather buy them on December 28th or 29th of the previous year rather than wait and buy them on January 15th. Because even if I think the January effect is a small one, I'd like to get that bonus. So. I use the January effect more as a timing device as to when to invest in stocks. So if you're able to augment the returns on your portfolio by 1% or 2% by taking advantage of the January effect, go ahead. There's also some evidence that what happens in January is predictive of what will happen for the rest of the year. That evidence is far weaker. I know there are, the, 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 there are these sayings, as January goes, so goes the rest of the year that the the evidence in that is far weaker so i wouldn't take those january the, what happens in january too far in terms of predicting what will happen over the rest of the year second effect that i want to talk about is the weekend effect if you take the last 50 60 70 years and in this case 1927 to through to the 2001 and you compute the returns by day of the week you can again see the stand up mondays are by far the way, worst day of the week to invest in and it's also the day where you're most likely to see more stocks go down than go up. Okay, that's called the weekend effect. And in fact, it's again fairly universally. Look across markets and pretty much every market you look at, there's a weekend effect. Mondays are worse days to invest in than any other day of the week. You know, Hong Kong, Canada, Japan, France, across the world, this is true. So what happens on Mondays? Here again are a couple of stories you might get told. Uh, well, one is that if you have bad news as a company, you're probably going to wait till after Friday close to reveal it, which means markets can't react till Monday morning. Again, for that story to hold, investors have to be letting it go by. In other words, if you believe that markets collectively reveal bad news on Friday and recoup and, and markets um, uh, and markets don't react till Monday, then you should be able to sell short on mark, you know, on those stocks, at least on a subset of stocks on Friday evening, and hope to cover up. Maybe those returns are not large enough to allow you to sell short, but that's one story. Is it's a new? It's an information story. There's an interesting follow-up graph I have, which looks at the day of the week returns by period starting in 1981 going through 2010, and there's an interesting sub-story here. The 1980s, for instance, the Monday effect is huge. It, the Monday returns are terrible relative to the rest of the week, though. You know. Then you get to the 1990s, and something does seem to happen. In fact, from 1991 through 2005, the weekend effect seemed to have disappeared. The Monday effect had become a positive effect. In fact, Fridays were the bad days of the week in, eight, in 91 through 95 and 2001 through 2005. If you go to the last decade, 2001 through 2010, Mondays have reverted back to being negative returns, but Fridays now have joined them as being negative return, week, ne negative return days as well. So something is clearly changing. Maybe it's a listing of options, triple witching hour, but Fridays have become much dicier days to invest in than they used to be. So perhaps the information story is no longer the story. It's a derivatives market story. The other markets feeding into the stock market affecting stock prices. How would I use the weekend effect? I don't. I, I'm not going to trade on, you know, on Tuesday rather than Monday. If I found a stock to be cheap on Monday, I'm going to buy it, notwithstanding what the historical evidence has suggested, because he uh, recognized that these are relatively small numbers. The negative Monday returns on it is minus 0.2%. And if you're buying a really good stock, that shouldn't eat into your portfolio very much. But it's, it is an interesting artifact eh, that you see across markets. So let me be very clear about the Monday effect. The Monday effect is really a weekend effect. What I mean by that is when you see those negative returns on Monday, most of them are in place at opening on Monday. They don't happen during the course of the day on Monday. 
it is the Monday effect is worse for small stocks than for larger stocks. So just as the January effect has a market cap influence, there seemed to be a market cap influence on the Monday effect as well. And the Monday effect is no worse. We have a three-day weekend rather than a two-day week. In fact, there are some, and as I said, the, the new story argument for Monday return seems to be the one that's most deeply entrenched. But as you can see, the shifts over time, maybe that story is no longer the dominant story explaining differences in returns across, uh, across different stocks and across time. Finally, just as a throwaway, I looked at, is there a holiday effect? In other, in other words, if you come back on a Monday, it's right after a weekend, and that's why returns are bad. Do you see negative returns after the 4th of July, after, I mean, after Memorial Day? And there the evidence seems to cut the other way. There seems to be little or no evidence suggesting that, that across, no holidays, maybe the 4th of July is an honorable exception. Across holidays, there is no evidence that when you come back, markets behave badly. So overall, reviewing, there are these strange calendar year and calendar time patterns in stock prices where you know, returns on stocks seem to do much worse in January than in other months of the year. That's true both in the U.S. and the rest of the world. Do much worse on Mondays than the rest of the week, though that effect seems to have weakened a little bit over the last 20 years. And Fridays seem to have become pretty bad days too. And there might be difference in returns even intraday, where certain times of the day, returns are worse than others and there might be a market microstructure reason for that traders who disappear who might be on the buy side rather than the sell side so basically i i i i for one do not incorporate any of these effects into my investing but if you want to just remember the returns the, we're talking about small numbers here and you've got to leverage them up to actually make money off any of these effects but it's, it's it is an interesting phenomenon to watch watch unfold not in, in pretty much every market. Thank you very much for listening.